All right, welcome to the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group webinar on growing language skills with immigrant families. We're just going to let folks enter the room a minute before we get started. Thanks for joining the webinar. We're just letting folks get in the room until we start. Okay. Well, I want to welcome everyone uh, to Growing Language Skill Skills with Immigrant Families, uh, Spreading and Adapting to Gen Working Practices. Uh, this event is sponsored by the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group um, and our partners at MPI, the Migration Policy Institute, and Ascend, which is another Aspen Institute program. So my name is Chris Estes. I'm one of two associate directors here at the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today is the third in a four-part series looking at different issues organizations raised in a survey that we conducted um, back in March of this year um, of organizations that serve immigrants from across the country. And we did a number of follow-up interviews this spring and summer to identify promising practices in response to issues people raised in the survey. I want to note the issues coming up uh, in November is our cultural competence secret to success um, on November 10th. And uh, our final, um, our next peer learning session uh, will come up following the growing language skills that we will talk, um, talk about in a minute. On October 28th, we'll hold a peer learning session on strategies uh, to work with immigrant families on growing language skills. This is an opportunity to submit a question related to a challenge you are having related to overcoming language barriers, which is a, and why it's a follow-up to today's webinar. We will choose two to three questions that will get direct dialogue with our presenter teams, as well as engagement with the larger audience. Uh, so this can be an, a, a worthwhile event if you have a question um, or if you're interested in the issues and learning more, it's a great chance to have more one-on-one -on -one dialogue with uh, your colleagues from around the country. You can submit your question in the chat box. Please note that the deadline is Monday, October 18th to submit a question. Um, for those of you utilizing social media, we hope you will um, talk about the event. Um, the speaker bios and other resources will be on the Aspen, C Aspen CSG website, as well as ultimately the video of this event. Everyone who's registered will, get a, registered will get a link to the recording. On social media, we hope you will share insights and thoughts on this event via Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and you can tag us with the following tags on the slide. So how to participate. So use the chat box to share thoughts and support points. Uh, we ask folks to do so civilly and with compassion. And use the Q&A box to specifically ask questions for the speakers. And please note, we built in Q&A will happen in the final 25 minutes. So as you think of questions as the, uh, you can submit questions as you hear speakers talking. And we will, um, some of those will get, you can, will get addressed directly via the Q&A box and some will be able to talk about um, uh, during the webinar. So why focus on language barriers? Uh, language issues were one of the four main topics that came up with the challenges that the, uh, from the March survey that I mentioned um, that organizations were struggling with who serve immigrants across the country. Uh, we wanted to note that of the folks, um, of the people who were serving immigrants, 93% of those um, were serving immigrants who use Spanish as their do uh, dominant language. But it's important to note the other most common languages, 42% Arabic, 34% French, 25% Chinese, and 22% Vietnamese show a real diversity. And also that 60% 
of the respondents noted they served other languages than these five. So it is a broad and diverse challenge um, that organizations have when they're working with a very diverse population across the country. So we wanted to talk briefly about the two generation approach. Um, in my work personally, I came to community development work starting in some early childhood developments in North Carolina that actually led to getting a master's in social work where really the asset framework and the whole family approach was really an important part of the curriculum. That philosophy has really been incorporated into the two gen model that it is moving from um, a tracks where organizations would be parent focused with some programs, child focused with other programs, and instead really thinking about how those two things connect for a whole family approach and so that um, benefits and interventions can be tracked across um, both and all elements of the family. This highlights, I think, the different elements of the um, two gen core components. So it's thinking holistically about family well being from education um, and social capital to health and well being uh, and economic assets. You'll hear a lot about these themes and elements uh, through the course of the agenda. So um, we're going to bring out both of our practitioners into the conversation and have them each talk about their organizations and their work side by side. Then we're going to bring Margie McHugh in from the Metropol uh, Migration Policy Institute to talk about common themes with policy issues. And then we'll bring everyone back together for a group Q&A session. So, First, it's my pleasure to introduce Banu Valleres, for the executive director of the Charlotte Bilingual Preschool, and Carissa Coltman Burnett, assistant director of family advancement at CAP Tulsa. Thank you both for joining us today. Let's get you guys off mute. Unmuting helps, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> so, what I wanted to start with to help folks understand um, your organizations and the setting that you all work in is to briefly talk a little bit about the context of your work um, so that they have some background. So Carissa, why don't you start? Um, yeah. Um, well, we're, uh, Cap Tulsa is in Tulsa County, which is in Oklahoma. Um, and our metropolitan area is around 1.1 million people. Um, and Cap Tulsa serves around in that area um, around 2,000 low to moderate income families, up to about 130% of the federal poverty uh, line through a combination of both Head Start and our early Head Start work, which is both center based and home visiting. And then we pair that with other services for the whole family. So that includes our English as a second language program, um, career coaching, parenting classes, um, services for families as they are transitioning out of our um, early childhood centers into the public school system, um, and then linkages to other community services and emergency financial assistance. Great, thank you. Bonu? Yeah, so... Um... I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, which is, uh, uh, Charlotte is the largest city in uh, the, the North Carolina, but also we're part of the Mecklenburg County, which is uh, the, uh, one of the largest counties in the state. Um, we have about a million people that are served with a median age of 35 and 13% uh, of people um, live in poverty there. Now, the Latinx population, about 14% of the population is Latinx and 27% of those children in the public school system actually identify as Hispanic Latinx. So it's a large number of the, of the school system population. And uh, one thing that I think it's important to know is that only 40% of Hispanic children ages three to eight are reading proficiently in those grade levels um, as opposed to their white peer, which is 81% of those children. Um, and then the graduation rates are 75% of uh, Hispanic children are graduating high school as opposed to 82%. So we know that there are challenges and there's very little representation in terms of teachers. Only 3% of the teachers in the school system are Latino. 
Great. Just one quick follow up. How recently has the immigrant population been a significant part of the community for both your areas? We're, we're just now having grandchildren. So um, it's a really recent population. And of course, I didn't talk about the programs that we serve, but you'll, you'll see me up for that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Carissa? Um, immigrants have been a part of um, Tulsa since the beginning. Um, so um, every, pretty much everyone besides our Native American population that is native to Oklahoma has, has immigrated here at some point. So it's okay. a long tradition there. Yeah, so interesting. So two places that have um, different historical histories with, with immigrants. So and one of the things, oh, go ahead. ahead. That's important to point out because uh, the, the needs of recent immigrants are really different than the, the needs of um, established populations um, because mm -hmm. even, even how we identify that language that we like to speak and all of that, it becomes very, um, it's different right? when we talk to uh, people who have been here for generations, Spanish is no longer um, an important thing, whereas for recent immigrants, the connection to, to the roots to the, the home language are still pretty strong. Right. So one of the things that led to our project initially was the recognition that the COVID-19 pandemic had put tremendous pressure on all human service agencies, but particularly for those organizations serving immigrants um, because they weren't always um, able to access funding to respond to those population needs. And um, so I'm curious how in particular your work around language skills um, changed or, or uh, adapted to the dynamics of the pandemic that obviously is still a factor for, our, for all of our communities. I don't want you to start with that. Sure. So, um, you know, what I forgot to mention is what is it that we do? Is that though the language is bilingual preschool, it, we do have a program that works with little people in a dual language model, which means we support the home language and then we introduce a new language, the importance of being able to build on the foundation that the home language already, the strong foundation that the home language um, begins to, to have. That is supported by a suite of family programs that are designed with families to support their children's education, but then also to support careers in, in education. So, you know, the, the very first thing that we saw in our population, we worked with some economically marginalized uh, children and families who speak Spanish at home and live in the county. And, you know, they were mostly the frontline workers. So what we saw was they lost jobs and then their capacity to um, feed themselves, which is a really horrible thing to experience, that immediately had to provide a shift in what we did, which was like, we uh, were not immediately thinking about um, a language, but we were really thinking about food and food, food stability for, for our families. And with that came a, a number of challenges that the federal government released uh, funding that was not accessible to our families because they required equal, everybody to have um, a citizenship in the, in the family when we know that immigrant populations don't have that. So that to say, we then have to move into remote learning with a population that has really high um, digital divide issues. So um, we, we transitioned to learning online, started with cell phones <laughs> and then moved to finding um, technology for the families and teaching them how to use technology online um, and did that really, really well. So our teachers did a great job of figuring out how to innovate. One of the things that we do really well is that we stay very connected with our families. And so we were able to design solutions with them um, when we had to come back in person, we were able to come back in person. We had several families that were very afraid of coming in person, how about half and half, right? Some of them needed to be back and some of them did not want to be back in person for fear of the, their children's um, deaths, really. Um, and we knew that our children were going to be disproportionately impacted because of interrupted learning. So 
we came up with this great uh, program called Reading Bridge. Uh, there was a local effort to ensure that children were going to have the um, continued reading skills through the pandemic and beyond. It's a, it's a, and the tool is, of course, in English. And um, because we knew that this was going to happen, we approached the, the funder and we just said, let us have this tool and let us figure out how to make it work for our families, which we did through the, um, through the pandemic. We also have um, a home visiting program that we have to move remote. And um, one of our family members who um, are the ones that we trained to deliver the home visiting program came up with this brilliant idea of a free visit video which really meant, you know, let, it, let me figure out how to tell you ahead of time what we're gonna do in the class before we show up and how you can be ready. And that led to a sort of pre-visit, visit, and then the family sent us a post-visit video showing us how they had um, implemented the, the learning with the children, which was an innovation that one of our families did. And we used that same um, model with the Reading Bridge. So there's this tool that is called the reading checkup, where you can actually sit with the child and test uh, their reading level, and it provides activities. So we added the layer of the three video contacts with families, mm -hmm. translate technology. Anyway, um, lots to say on that, but um, th those are a couple of the, of the innovations that we were able to use and continue to use through this year and last year to serve the children who were not wanting to come, whose families did not want to bring them in person, and they were really successful. Great, thank you. Uh, Carissa, talk a little bit about how you all responded to the language work um, during that with COVID. Yeah, um, for just a little bit more context, around um, 35 to 40 percent of the families we serve um, speak a language other than English at home, so it's a pretty high population for us. Um, Spanish is the number one language spoken at home, but we also have a high population of refugees from Myanmar. And so Zomi and Burmese are actually our second highest um, languages in, in our schools. And so um, primarily when families come to us, they are really, um, they want uh, their children to have a strong education and they want to be involved in their children's education. And so, our ESL classes are actually really contextualized to that. Um, it really focuses on the language and vocabulary and understanding of the school system um, for you to sort of take what you learn in the classroom today and you know go pick your child up and, and practice it with your child's teacher. And so when the pandemic hit, um, you know, our families were really in quite a bit of crisis. A lot of them, similar to what Banu said, um, they lost their income, they lost their jobs. Um, and so they, they were in crisis and across our whole system, um, we really had to sort of like pause um, and not only sort of recalibrate for ourselves, um, you know, like many, we had to go and shift almost immediately from an entirely in-person service delivery um, to, to remote and virtual. And I'm sure we could, we could spend the whole afternoon kind of talking about the challenges that came with that. But really it also, um, we paused a lot of the service delivery that we were doing um, and really sort of asked ourselves, what, what do families need right now? Um, and they just, they needed connection. Um, in many cases, they were very isolated. Um, they needed connection to resources in the community. Um, many of our families, um, like Banu said, did not qualify for a lot of the assistance that was rolled out um, towards the beginning of the pandemic. And so we really focused on um, helping people get access to groceries, um, getting access to mental health supports, just moving from our coaches calling them and asking, you know, how are you doing on your English goals to having those same coaches calling them and just asking, how are you doing? How's your family doing? What do you guys need? Um, and then trying to meet them um, with those needs. And so, um, that was really sort of one of the biggest things that happened there at the beginning. And then towards the summer, um, that's when we really realized, okay, we're going, this is going to be here for a while. We're going to need to shift service delivery um, to be virtual. And so we also rolled out um, quite a bit of Chromebook and devices and training for families. 
Um, again, a lot of our families come to us with very low uh, levels of literacy and low levels of digital literacy. And so it wasn't just about getting a computer um, to a family so that they could participate in distance learning. It was also teaching them how do you, how do you log into that. Um, it was helping them create um, Gmail accounts so that they could actually log into that Chromebook device and then providing a lot of hands-on support to them. Um, throughout that process. We also um, were able to be um, a conduit of some funding that was really specifically meant for families that did not qualify for a lot of the federal supports. And so we, um, we had, prior to the pandemic, a very small emergency assistance sort of arm of our work, um, and that really grew um, through the pandemic. And so we, we saw families really in need of groceries, of diapers, um, uh, money to help uh, not uh, lose your home. Um, and so that's where a lot of our, our work has shifted since then. Um, we also transitioned um, our early childhood work uh, to distance learning um, last fall. And then our adult uh, classes for ESL also shifted to, to distance learning. Um, and they actually have just this semester um, gone back in person. Thank you both for that. That's great. We have heard that from, you know, organizations in, in all of our interviews and in uh, serving the whole range of immigrants and refugees across the country and in the webinars we've done of the of those challenges to really help families meet immediate needs. And it was very difficult, but often one of the benefits people discussed was that there were new levels of sort of trust and relationship building with immigrant families uh, and the organizations because they had pivoted to really respond to what their most urgent needs were and that they were um, showing that level of commitment of find, you know, whether it was finding new funding or new strategies, new partners. So um, I think that's a great, uh, great uh, examples that you all talked about. So now we're gonna pivot into more of the, um, detailed sort of discussion of your practices and innovations in, um, in your work related to language skills. And so, um, Bono, I'm going to come back to you to sort of talk more specifically about what your interventions um, uh, to grow language skills uh, and, and how you all sort of have evolved to get a little bit to these places, but most importantly, what you've done and how you did it, I think are the things we really want to emphasize so that the audience really can think about how they might replicate these things uh, back in their communities. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, we, we started 22 years ago in response to a community need. Um, they, you know, we were noticing that uh, children were not starting kindergarten ready, particularly Spanish speaking children and African American children. So there were three preschools that were birthed um, very near each other, two for serving African American children one year and then the child bilingual. And originally, we were started as an English only school. Um, we went literally, we got a grant from our uh, partnership for children, uh, Smart Start. For hundred thousand dollars, and we had two people, and we went door to door recruiting people. <laughs> so that's how it all started. And those two people did everything. I, I was not here at the time, but I but I knew the people who were starting it. And and the um, preschool grew from um, those five children to thirty five, and now we serve in the preschool program one hundred and twenty six, and then in a similar amount of um, children in our family programs that connect both children and families. So. It's been a, um, we quickly understood that uh, that home language was super essential and that we should um, develop a dual language model. So what that means is that we, we hire two teachers, one that leads in both bilingual, but one that leads in one language and one in the other. We literally just found a, a, a national guru to teach us how to do that and have been doing that really well ever since. So we, we have a, the only five-star licensed dual language program in the state. Um, so that, that side of it, I think that the, the other side of it is, is uh, our cultural competency and uh, you know, the, the team is mo mostly bilingual, bicultural, 40% of the team members, we're now 40 some, 
40% of us are former families, our current families. So we have been really focused on building uh, our own workforce from our families because we know that this becomes a challenge. And I think that um, from the family program side, right, how do we start younger? I mentioned the Parent Child Plus uh, home visiting program that trains our families. And then this idea is this new idea of Reading Bridge, which is that we just have to, we have to do something else for families that are not going to want to show up or maybe we don't have the capacity to serve them. And it's again, looking for what are the tools that are available? How do we adjust those tools to make them work for our families? And how do we move them forward? And how do we find the funding? And I think that that um, designing with our families has been um, a model that we've used for several years now. And, and so it, it ends up being really successful for because we only do what they prefer. And shifting our focus from a needs base to a strengths base, which is really focusing on what are our dreams, aspirations, values, priorities for our families and go from there. One last thing that we did when I came on board uh, four years ago, we hired a uh, research and evaluation director. This is like the best hire ever. Uh, and I knew I needed one. I am a big, big data person. And I, I think that with the right with data, you can, you can fix things, right? But you can name things. So one of the first things that we looked at was social capital, right? How do we define social capital? How do we measure it? And we know that there are two types of relationships that build social capital, bridging and uh, bonding relationships. Bridging are with people that are not like us, bonding with people like us. We assumed that our families would have more bonding than bridging relationships, but it's actually the opposite. They have more bridging relationships, so they're very isolated basically, and children cannot learn in isolation and the families are, do not have friends. So we've been super intentional to create kinship between our families. And uh, one of the things that I think we, sh we showed with the team was our uh, social networks map, which is really nerdy, but we really um, surveyed our families to figure out who are you friends with? And we can literally figure out where are the groups of friends that we can then expand and intentionally create new groups of friends so that our families have the, the social capital that they need and the support that they need to um, um, feel stable in the community. So anyway, um, lots of that, lots of that. <laughs> That's great, thank you. And we'll come back and ask you some more about that. So um, Carissa, talk a little bit about, more, more about um, your, uh, your organization's sort of interventions and strategy and, and really how you all have done, approached your work in growing language skills. Yeah, um, so our first really two gen offering um, was a workforce development program called Career Advance. And I think, um, I mean, there, there was quite a bit of that that we learned that was really successful with families. Um, and we thought this um, model would transition into ESL um, and that that would be a way for us to on-ramp um, our families into career training and um, through that process, we went out to families and we did um, interviews. We actually um, sort of deputized families um, within our schools to conduct peer interviews. And uh, we collected about 300 interviews with families and asked them, you know, what do you want in an ESL class? And they told us that they didn't want workforce training ESL. They told us that they wanted, um, like I mentioned before, um, language skills that would help them interact on a day-to-day, -day, um, especially with the, the school system, but also just um, interacting in their community. And so using that feedback from those families, um, that, that is the program that we, we designed and offered. And I think that that um, experience and sort of being responsive to what families were telling us really set us up where that is a practice that we have embedded at all levels of that, that program. So um, we get feedback from families on a regular basis through many informal conversations um, with their career coach. And then they also, we collect more formal things through surveys and we have um, had a, a evaluation done separately as well. 
Um, but then whenever we're thinking about something new, um, whether or not it's adding another class level, we go, we go to our families and we get their input on, okay, what does, how does this need to look different? So when we started the program, we just did two classes. Um, we were serving beginning and intermediate, about 15 people in each class. And so when it became time to grow the program, we went to those families and said, what do you want in an advanced class? Um, is advanced English different for you um, than maybe what you're looking for in a beginning class? And so we tweaked that offering based on what they told us. And so that um, sort of rhythm of collecting uh, feedback from families, I think, really is what helped us um, with the pandemic because it helped us be more responsive to what families were telling us they needed. And then we, you know, the shift from in-person classes to, to distance learning and sort of virtual ESL, we realized that it's not, it is not as simple as just like, okay, well now I do this, but on Zoom. Um, and so we, uh, we did a lot of piloting that first summer of 2020 with some families and just said, okay, uh, what, what's working, what's not working for you. And so the offering that we have held this last year um, has looked very different from our in-person classes. Um, you know, I don't know whether or not the tweaks that we've made would make sense in your community, um, but I know that the tool of asking um, your families what, what they want and need and um, sort of what is the most helpful um, will help you uh, design something that will meet their needs. And, and I have two really good examples of, of that, you know, for, for us, you know, we, I'm in a rush, I want to grow, I want to, you know, do things quickly. And, um, you know, um, when about three years ago, when we were looking at our children's entry level um, scores, right, where they were, they, they've been declining over time, and we've seen a correlation between their developmental readiness um, over time and, and the anti-immigration uh, policies that have kept our families from addressing other services. Anyway, I was thinking, we just gotta do a lot more of supporting the families to support their children's education. And um, then <laughs> I was thinking, why do we do ESL classes? They can go take ESL classes someplace else, right? We don't need that. We asked our families and overwhelmingly, they said, we need ESL classes. How are we gonna how do, we, how do we navigate the rest of this system, right? And then how are we even going to get jobs if we don't speak the language? So that was one of those great correcting moments. Um, mm -hmm. my, my other great correcting moment was like thinking, hey, we should do before and after school. We've got the YMCA, they've got it, they can come pick them up, right? Then we asked our families, surveyed them. And our families were like, no, we don't know them. We don't wanna put our children in buses. So. If we had gone ahead and done that, <laughs> I would have been a complete flop. So two, two really good lessons about why we should ask first, um, to your point, because without, without asking, we would not be serving them properly. Yeah, that's great. And it actually is a great segue. We've got about um, 10 minutes before we shift over to the policy side of things. Um, but I did want to follow up with both of you about who were the important partnerships for you all in your work? You've obviously had, you know, really strong themes of this family-centered design, um, but, and, and Bonnie, you noted sort of the dangers of, of partnering with people uh, programmatically that, organ that the clients' families may not know. Um, so, uh, Chris, why don't you start, and then we'll come back to Bonnie on, on this, sort of like who you're who you recommend people partner with. I noted that someone in the chat had asked about the library in particular, so. Yeah, I was actually about to answer that. And then I heard you sort of tee up that question. So I, I was gonna save and answer that one live. But um, I think one of the other things that we have learned um, that has been key for us is that, um, so our, you know, our core is around early childhood. Um, and then we're wrapping a lot of these services around our families. Um, and sometimes there are um, other providers in the community that are doing that work really well, and sometimes there is not. And so 
we really look at the landscape and sort of identify like if there's someone else there who's in that space who's doing great work there how do we partner with them um, and then sometimes it's also helping them learn um, how they may need to tweak some of their services to meet the needs of our, our families and our the population we're serving. But in many cases, um, the population we're serving and the population they're serving is really, really similar. Um, and so helping them see like how small tweaks can help families um, helps us all to, to be better service providers. So one of the questions was around um, the library. Um, Tulsa is blessed to have an amazing um, public library system, um, but a lot of our families don't always know that those resources are available to them and that there's so many free resources there. So one of our favorite uh, sort of perennial favorite field trips is to take our beginning students to um, the library you know, give them a tour, help them see all the resources there, help them get signed up uh, with a library card so that they can access those on their own. And then um, our other um, really big partner with our ESL classes is actually the, the public school system, um, which um, operates adult education in, in Tulsa County. And so we partner with them um, and have brought sort of this contextualized curriculum and they, um, they bring the instructors. And so we, we work together to, to offer those classes for, for our students. So that is, that is I think, one of the, the biggest examples of how we've leveraged those partnerships, but it also comes in other ways. I think there was a question that I answered earlier around um, how we sort of prepared our instruct, instructor staff um, to be social workers overnight with the pandemic. Um, and one thing that I uh, forgot to mention is that we actually have behavioral health and mental health support staff embedded in our schools. Um, and so in many cases, it, it wasn't um, like a full burden on, on a teacher to turn into a social worker, but you have that family support specialist who's right there um, making those phone calls as well and, and checking in with families, so. Thanks, Anu, yeah. for your partnerships. Yeah, so you know, we started with churches for location, right? Where where might we find the space? Uh, and and did that, and uh, a lot of that had to do with you know similar kind of uh, service mission. Um, then we partner with a whole bunch of um, uh, therapy serving uh, organization, child speech and hearing, uh, Thompson Family Focus, Milestone. These are organizations that could provide occupational. Um, behavioral and speech and hearing therapy for our children for free, which is awesome. They have a mandate, right? Um, so, so we've done that um, for scale and uh, for funding. The county uh, three years ago started a universal pre-K model. So we have been able to leverage that relationship to fund about 60% of our five four-year-old um, classrooms of, of our five, yeah, five four-year-old classrooms. So that's been a pretty fruitful partnership. It is. Um, it comes with challenges, right? When you work with any partner, particularly a partner that that provides a lot of funding, because you have to ensure that um, you're not sacrificing your model to fit the somebody else's uh, restrictions. But that's been super helpful. Most recently, with the community college, we have seen the need. We have a really ambitious strategic plan to serve 1,500 children in the next eight years. Um, and uh, to do that, we clearly are going to continue to work with the county, but we're going to need a ton of teachers, right? And it's not like we have lots of uh, dual language educators uh, floating around. Um, this is when our work really turned truly to Jan, when we started asking our families, what are the biggest challenges that you find? And one of them is uh, career pathways. So we have worked with the community colleges to offer uh, early education classes in Spanish for our families and then provide uh, um, occupational ESL. And um, we have graduated now like 60 some uh, families from several of the classes and we've got, um, we have designed an apprenticeship model that we are um, implementing at Charlotte Bilingual to do the overlay of dual language um, work. But really it's basically looking to see where the money is and when there is alignment for mission. There's an organization called Charlotte Works that helps pay for a portion of the apprenticeship fees. And, and, and it's just about that because um, uh, with, with anything, 
Um, you have to have a really good idea. You have to find a partner that has the willingness and the mission alignment and then do it so that you can get to scale. Yeah, that's great. I, I did want to follow up with both of you since we in the last few minutes here about that notion of how you trained your staff in this in this family centered design. Uh, obviously, with when you're hiring families from within the community, that may be a more natural flow. Um, but I'm curious, not uh, you both have talked about sort of pivoting from that natural we'll decide what we think families need and offer it to them. Um, but also there's a transition of how you prepare your staff for that, knowing that neither one of your workforces are completely former clients um, who are fluent in, in the languages. How, how have you all approached that sort of staff training internally? Krista, why don't you start and then we'll come back to Bonnie. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think that is perennially an, an issue um, and just thinking about uh, being responsive to families. Um, I will say, and I think I mentioned it in the chat, um, the prosperity agenda, the family-centered coaching, um, we, we, that's, that's the training um, that we're using right now for a lot of our frontline staff, not just our coaches. Um, I think one of the things that I love about it is it really in sort of encourage you to view that family um, is creative, responsive, and whole, that they are the experts in their family. Um, and so when we're, we're thinking about um, what, what families need and how do, how do we train staff to be responsive to that, um, teaching them to sort of keep that at the forefront of their interactions, um, it means that even if they um, have had a different background, um, that it helps them to be active listeners with the families that they're sitting in front of. Um, but I will say that we, we do really look for and, and try to hire um, staff that have backgrounds that, are, that will resonate with our families um, so that they, um, you know, if they have gone through the process of learning English, even if it was in an entirely different setting, they can relate to those challenges. Um, and also just being an, an encourager um, to families as they bump up against obstacles uh, to continue to attend class, um, which our parents have many. So um, having someone who can cheer them along really sometimes is uh, the element that keeps them going when things are difficult. Thanks. Other more you want to say on that space? Yeah, yeah. You know, we, I think that this, for us, it's really in the hiring process, right? It's like we really, like Carissa mentioned, we because we, we focus on a dual language approach, then everybody has to be bilingual, that it's going to be working directly in, in programming. Um, and everybody else, we expect to have um, pretty high uh, cultural uh, competency and really strong um, mission alignment and understanding of our values, our top values, comunidad, and we define it in a very Latino way, which is... Uh, the health of the community comes before the health of the individual. So we look for that. And once you know that, that you are driven to ensure that it, it's all first before I am there, um, it, 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 it helps a lot. Um, and then we, we, we also use the strength-based approach. We, we know that uh, trust is uh, an issue that, and it's one of our values, trust building. So we orient people to that. And again, we hire and train to, to that. So I think having a pretty clear values and um, a deep understanding of who you're looking for. Um, I think one of the things that makes Charlotte Benigal Preschool incredibly unique is that the other is the majority. <laughs> we, we, sound like, we sound like this, we look like this. <laughs> and it's a whole bunch of us. And so, when a family walks in and they are, you know, they are this, it immediately feels uh, safe. Um, it, it feels uh, you're fully heard because there's nothing more traumatic than having a full thought that you're limited in your communication of because you don't have the right amount of language. And to be able to express yourself in that language is just so important. And, and so that's, um, I think that th those are the, the, the key, key ways that we ensure that our team um, aligns. 
That's great. You're you're both um, really helping to tee up our our next theme in uh, November around cultural competency, and obviously all of these challenges and responses do interconnect. You know, whether it's building trust and cultural competency and language skills, um, and and particularly dealing with immigration status, are all interconnected key uh, components. So we're going to um, shift now and bring in Margie McHugh uh, to to give some policy uh, reaction uh, to um, what we've just heard. Margie is the director of the National Center on Immigrant Integration Policy at Migration Policy Institute. Uh, Margie, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Chris. And um, we are gonna um, start, well, start, I guess I'll open with sort of some um, context about, uh, You've heard many important issues and pro approaches. Are there some common themes or reflections that you've heard uh, that you wanted to underscore? Um, well, I guess the first thing I wanted to say was that for people who are listening in, uh, who maybe are um, trying to start programs for the first time, um, have hope, don't be intimidated that, uh, that both of these fantastic programs that we've been talking about uh, have been working at it for, for 20 plus years. Uh, you know, this is, I do think that things are changing, although Banu, I was, I'm, I don't think I had registered what you said uh, just uh, earlier that I think you said you're the only um, uh, bilingual preschool in North Carolina. Oh, oh the only five-star licensed. Um, there are several others, but the only one that really focuses on Spanish and English. Many yeah. <laughs> so I looked up when you said that, I looked on our uh, data sheet for your state and, um, and DLOs are 30% of the zero to five population in North Carolina. Uh, so another time we can get into the weeds on things like QRIS systems and quality ratings, but, uh, but, you know, it, it just, um, there, there's so much distance still to go to have um, systems really be uh, uh, providing responsive quality services um, to Im uh, immigrant families. And um, so anyway, Chris, about, um, about uh, kind of overall um, policy themes and, uh, and reflections, I think I'll, I'll start with the early childhood space even though both programs are truly two gen with trying to, you know, with doing work with, uh, with uh, uh, children and families. So the, the early childhood space is pretty complex because it's chopped up across so many different um, types of systems. But, uh, but I, think the, I think the real hope there is that if we're in an equity moment, if we really are gonna be having more serious conversations about, uh, about advancing equity, then I think the data are just unavoidable. And, and you know, that's one of the bets we're making at our organization is let's hurry up and get fresh data into everyone's hands and you can look at it from a variety of, uh, 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 you can use a variety of lenses, certainly race and ethnicity, um, but I, I know for, um, for both CAP Tulsa um, and for Charlotte Bilingual Preschool that, um, you know, that, they're, that they're fairly used to using a lot of arguments that um, education systems and social services systems understand. So if you're starting with families that are in poverty, and then talking about other challenge factors uh, uh, like things like limited English proficiency of parents, low levels potentially of formal education, um, digital access or um, digital literacy challenges. You know, if we, if we were to get serious about uh, connecting some of, those, uh, some of those issues, I think it could really drive uh, services and change the way RFPs are designed and all that sort of stuff to, um, to really allow programs to be more responsive, Ugh, which is another thing I wanted to say. We, we, of course, for everyone who's on the call, no big surprise, we had a prep call <laughs> for, this, um, uh, for this session and some prior conversations. But, uh, 
but you know the we don't have time today to get into how hard it is to fit these responsive services into mainstream funding sources um, because they just expect um, different outcomes. So, so first of all, I'll, I'll just say in the early childhood space that, um, that one of the really big policy issues is how to make dual language learner children and families um, matter, make them visible, um, in the early childhood space. And uh, so one of the things that we've done um, that, that we think is a, is a very powerful thing to try and move forward on policy-wise, we could do it through any of the major ECEC programs, uh, whether it's partly with all the money coming down into childcare now uh, as part of pandemic recovery, um, also pre-K expansion. But if we would get serious about identifying dual language learner kids in ECEC programs, it would just open up so many opportunities to advance equity um, for those young children. And it's, it's really strange that K-12 completely understands the English learner issue. It's deeply embedded in law. There are, there are um, approaches and services that are triggered. The moment you get to kindergarten, and yet we're making all these investments in early childhood to, to close the gap in many cases before kids start kindergarten. Uh, but the system sort of systems just throw up their hands and say, you know, don't you understand how impossible it is for us to do that? No, it is not impossible. Um, there, there, and there are a number of good practices out there. Um, I would say at the county level um, in, a, in a really robust way, um, and I, I loaded into the, um, into the chat um, two resources that we put together around this. One is we, we tried to have a consensus building pro um, uh, process to come up with what, we, what would be a framework of how to do this and, and how to embed it in systems uh, that could be helpful. And then also a scan that showed uh, what's happening in that regard. But I just think to, to try and uh, to try and drive things like the very progressive bilingual uh, preschool initiative that happened in Charlotte towards the kinds of services um, that you're able to pro provide, for example, Banu, and by the way, to not have you have to raise 50% of the funds to do it. That was a big shocker when I heard that. You know, this question uh, we were talking about of whose work is this? Well, if we're doing public pre-K expansion, why are you having to raise 50% of the funds to do this program? So I'm sorry, I'll get down off that soapbox. Um, but let me get up on another one, Carissa, about your program. <laughs> so, um, so, so the other sort of quasi-therapy session that we had um, before the webinar um, we talked about how hard it is to do parent-focused adult education programs, why we kept the idea of parents in the law that governs uh, the provision of adult education services. But then we took, this is in 2014, um, uh, we, uh, the federal government took all of the requirements, the, the performance measures, there's six of them, that regular adult education and ESL programs have to um, meet, they took all the requirements from workforce training programs and made them the adult education performance measures. So if you're trying to teach ESL uh, to parents of young kids who both of you said, you talk, you know, what, what do your parents want? They want to figure out um, what's going on in the early childhood space. Um, how can they interact with their kids programs and teachers with other services, really understand the education system well, the measures for mainstream programs are employment. Um, I think it's I think it's um, three months and six months or four months, and it, it's it's two quarters. There there are two quarterly measures that you're supposed to be employed after completing the program. You're supposed to make a significant wage gain. Employers are supposed to be satisfied. Show that um, uh, satisfaction with your service. It's totally employment focused. So we've seen so many programs have to close the door over the last, uh, close their doors over the last five years or so, uh, because if you're serving parents who don't work outside the home, uh, and especially parents of young children who are, who 
who are also home because there's not linguistically and culturally competent childcare services or pre-K services, well, you're just not going to meet those requirements. And so, of course, you're dinged as being an ineffective provider on top of everything else, which we've also seen. So I think there's a lot of, of you know, there's a few really, um, really uh, big issues in both of these policy spaces that maybe now we really are ready to have more of a conversation about because we're moving a lot of money into the early childhood um, space as part of pandemic recovery. But also in the meantime, so many of the rules, so, so much money is put in by states for pre-K expansion. And um, also states have to match their federal dollars and very for adult education and they often overmatch them. So, so at least on the adult ed side, um, states that, that overmatch their federal dollars could use some of those dollars that they it just pull them out of the match and put it into the kinds of programs that'll really help them out in the early childhood space. And, um, and then certainly they can make more progressive and, um, and equitable rules in terms of how they're gonna distribute their, um, their ECEC funds and their pre-K expansion funds. Anyway, Chris, sorry, I probably said I would give a short answer there, but I got carried away. I get so annoyed I'm um, having to listen to the struggles of programs trying to do services that everyone thinks it's easy for them to provide, you know, when they're just paddling upstream, you know, the whole time trying to make, make existing funding sources work. No, that's great. And thank you. Uh, so we've got about six more minutes before we're going to shift into Q&A. So I did want to get you to respond to, um, given that there are federal policies related to moving, removing language barriers in federal funding programs, federal funded programs, are there particular policies that might be leveraged to move family focused services towards improving the availability of linguistically and cultural competent services? Yeah, I think, you know, if, you, if, if we think of this as, yet another 20 year period of, um, of really trying to adapt services. Um, I think the, the pathway there is, is trying to address linguistic and cultural competence, whatever field one is in. And, uh, and, and as I said earlier, in the early childhood space, you're dealing with five or six different systems. In the adult ed space, your adult ed workforce and maybe also um, uh, doing this associated with something like the model Carissa that you have where, you know, where it's also more of a, of a family model. But, um, but uh, so in terms of basic linguistic and cultural competence, um, there have been rules in place since um, Bill Clinton was president. He did an executive order uh, that basically said that, uh, that it was, it's a, based on civil rights law, um, federally funded services are, uh, must be available, can, cannot, um, cannot uh, have a person not be able to access that services due to language barriers. Essentially, um, you really are responsible from a civil rights perspective if you're receiving federal dollars um, to ensure that you're not, uh, that LEP individuals are able to access that service. So I'm, I'm, sure no, I'm pretty sure no one from Department of Justice is, is on the webinar, so I'll feel free to say this. Um, you know, basically what happens, the way that gets implemented very often is you're a federal agency and you say, as you pass money through to states, um, you know you're supposed to make sure that there's language access plans so people can access these services. And the states just say back to the federal government, check. Yes, we, know, we told everybody they need to have a language access plan, but there's really very little implementation of it. There's a few important um, uh, complaint processes that offices of civil rights within federal agencies have spent years bringing lawsuits against Denver public schools, against the San Francisco. You know, there, there's a lot of school districts that, for example, that are operating under some of these consent decrees around language access, but you know, generally speaking, I would say in the early childhood space, we're pretty far behind in terms of having language access rules apply. And where they do apply, it might be that you're telling families in multiple languages that um, things like 
um, you know, child care vouchers exist. But then if you actually try to get child care in any of those languages it's being advertised in, you know, you can't access the actual service. And so, you know, what, what parent is going to leave their child with someone that you can't tell them, you know, oh, the baby was up part of the night, or, you know, I, I'm a little worried about this or that with my child, you know, the, the, you know, and then that also gets into not just language, but also cultural comfort and the like, which, um, which we've been talking about. But anyway, I, I do think that, um, you know, the first executive order that President Biden signed was an advancing equity in federal programs um, executive order. And there's a big process underway right now at the federal level. And um, many states and localities are also um, looking at equity and thinking about, uh, about linguistic and linguistically and culturally competent services. So I, I just feel like this is, this is a one or two year period where I think we're going to see a lot of movement in that and that you know, for folks on the phone who might be tired of having raised these issues for the last 10 years, um, I would say get your energy back because I do think that um, this is really a moment. And, um, and I'll also load up something into the chat. We're going to be doing a webinar on state and local language access laws next week out of our shop that, um, you know, might be, might, th those might be the kinds of things that folks could put some energy into also because you have a little more accountability if your state and locality has its own language access law that kind of um, builds off the federal law, but then also really checks to see that, you know, services are being provided in, um, in languages that families uh, can understand. Thanks so much. Um, we're going to shift into the Q&A period. I don't see anything active in the Q&A box, but I wanted to kind of build on the theme that Margie was talking about um, and ask each of you, and then Margie, I wanna to come to you on the federal level, but how have you all thought about and been active in building the support for your client population um, as, as a group? Often people will um, be supportive of immigrant populations from an employment standpoint because they offer cheap labor and people recognize that they will do jobs um, and there's some economic growth, but often that does not translate to the education of particularly of children uh, for that same level of support. So I'm curious how you all have engaged your organizations in, um, in the political support uh, and in public investments at your local, you know, whether it's your city and county level um, for the education efforts that you guys have described here today. Um, I don't want you start and then I'll come back to Krista and then I want to come to Margie about sort of more about the federal level of stuff she was talking about. Yeah, I think I think you you start with the numbers, right? This is this is where I am, um, you know, big on um, data. So when when you look at just in general, without a high quality dual with our high without a high quality preschool education, children start a year behind period, right? A year behind. It takes them, they can't catch up. Um, they're gonna be twice as, half as likely to read at third grade level. They're not gonna graduate high school, right? So now, now we've got an issue here. Then when you start looking at the reading levels of Spanish speakers in our current school system, which is, we, we mentioned, right? 40% of them are reading at grade level between third and eighth grade compared to 81% of our white, uh, their white peer we now have an, an equity issue, right? So being able to talk about that and addressing from that perspective, plus also understanding the, the benefits of bilingualism, right? That, that bilingualism is not an evil thing that you have to be cured from, which, which was the, the, it was really our original approach, right? It's like, well, these children just need to learn to speak English, right? And really it's, it's the beauty of what a bilingual brain can do. So we've been doing that level of advocacy at the, at the local level, you know, this is how we're building the relationships with the county, but also at the state level beginning to, I think that because of the pandemic where we really saw how the system is stacked up against people of color, people of uh, different um, languages, but particularly people of color, right? Um, and the disproportionate impact that it will have in our economic mobility um, because we're not getting the language skills now. Uh, it, we're becoming bolder to, to just go ahead and talk to people about what is the, the barrier that we see 
we've also been pretty smart to connect with people like California, right? To say, what, what are the policy agendas that you're building? And we're locally now, I'm working with um, um, a state level funder to begin to build and uh, with, a, with a cohort to begin to build an advocacy, a very active um, dual language advocacy agenda that we can bring to the state and to our local people. So, um, it, it, and, and I think it begins with the numbers, right? At, at, depending on who the audience is, you know, we talk about how much money you're gonna save if you, um, if you fix the problem now, right? If you attack it now, if that child is ready for kindergarten, you're gonna save all the extra money of fixing things. And then from the people who are willing to hear it, this is a race equity issue, right? This is a systemic barrier issue that we have to fix. Understanding that if we don't fix it now, we're not gonna have the, the economic mobility that we're looking for. We were fortunate in Charlotte that a national study named Charlotte 50 out of 50 cities in the United States for economic mobility, which means that if you're born in Charlotte or live in Charlotte in poverty, you're 4.5% percent likely to get out of it. This is immoral. And I think that we feel very ashamed about it. And we use those numbers all the time in terms of, uh, you know, how this impacts. And so I think that, that, that it, is, it is about being, not being afraid to name the system. This is the right time. I think that the pandemic has allowed us to, to it put on our face where the system, how the system has been created to leave our families behind. And we can just name it and say, we, we are fixing that. You come along. And you, sometimes you use shame too, right? <laughs> shame on you for not doing this. Go ahead and, and get on the right side of the, of the corner. Yeah, that's great. I was actually going to ask what, what were sort of some key talking points for, for just a frame of reference. Uh, um, I actually lived in North Carolina for about 25 years and actually lived in Charlotte briefly. But Charlotte's history was its identity racially was really centered around that it was one of the more successful uh, racial integration and education experiences in the South compared to some other places. And it was very proud of that. It had thought of itself very much as kind of a chamber of commerce business city and that we want everybody to succeed. And so I think that um, that study that really looked at economic mobility was a jarring uh, sort of slap in the face for that community to provoke a lot of discussion about what that meant for, for people of color. And even, um, at, Chris, even at this time with that report, with all of that, the conversation continues to be black and white. And I know that the conversation needs to be black and white. And when right. part of the population is other, we, we can't continue to have conversations about black and white. It needs to be about how are we taking care of everybody who is in the margins, right? How are we designing from the margins on? So Margie, I, I, I just got on my soapbox and I'm going to get off too. <laughs> <laughs> so Carissa, you know, Tulsa has another, you know, also has a, um, a significant racial history and um, again, more in the black, white uh, dynamic. But you noted that the immigrant population has been a much longer part of the sort of cultural fabric of the community. How have you all built political support for the education investments and, and relationships for the work you all are doing? And were there key messages that you felt like sort of moved people off of the, um, the, the typical reactions of like, these are folks that are taking our tax dollars that aren't paying in, or they're making our schools more less competitive or um, detracting from education of others, things like that. Yeah. Um... So Tulsa is, we just exceeded over a million people like in our metropolitan area, but it is probably um, the biggest small town that you will ever visit. Um, and, you know, behind that is like, you know, there's the good, bad and the ugly about that. Um, but I will say that Tulsa, like I'm sure many places, um, relationships are what sort of gets things done. Um, and so I think we have really looked at the opportunity um, in Tulsa to, to build relationships with our public school systems and our city officials and thinking about how we can use sort of the place that we have influence over in order to move, um, you know, move those agendas forward. So um, 
our, the children that sort of leave our system feed into quite a few different school districts. And so it has been a long, hard road to build relationships in all of those districts to be able to even do something like get information about how that child is doing um, in first, second, third grade. Um, but that is, you know, that data, um, like Banu said, it speaks um, really powerfully when you can look at that and see the difference um, that high quality early childhood ed makes for, for all children um, who are moving, in, moving into kindergarten, especially those who are starting um, from a disadvantaged place. And so um, having that data is hard work. <laughs> Um, and in some cases it's slow, but I think building those relationships and helping people see like, hey, we have the same goal. We want these children and these families to succeed. Like how can we stand um, next to each other and look at the problem um, and how do we solve that together versus maybe looking at it from the perspective of you guys in the public school system are failing, you know, these, these little ones. And so um, I think that has been helpful in moving things forward. And then um, just the community in Tulsa in general, I feel like there's been a lot of support um, for first uh, initiatives around welcoming immigrants and um, even just something that we have seen um, the last couple of years is the shift to uh, you know, acknowledging that there are other languages spoken in Tulsa besides just Spanish. I mean, Spanish is for sure um, the the next language beyond English, but we've seen our, our city, um, you know, when they're doing press conferences, they, you know, they will um, have that interpreted beyond just Spanish. And so that, I think that's been a big move. Um, and I think it helps sort of, especially since a lot of those are going out on social media, it, it starts to sort of elevate and people can see like, I can go on there and watch that press conference in Zomi. Um, and maybe I've never met someone um, who speaks that language, but suddenly I'm more aware of how multicultural my city really is. Great, thank you. Yes, I wanted to also um, play up the, the story, right? Stories are also super important. And, you know, so figuring out what's the story that you tell about a particular child, about a particular family around our workforce development. Um, and this just kind of naturally happened, right? When our first group of families graduated from the first education class that they took in the middle of a pandemic, experiencing food and job insecurity, right? I mean, amazing effort that they've done with children at home, they're taking a class. One of them said, I hope that this is the beginning of the careers with dignity that we came to the United States for. And, you know, that story, that in itself, right? Shifts the way that you perceive a family from whatever you take in my job to somebody who really wants to be uh, the, the word dignity, how she used it, you know, the, the, those stories, which they have for me, they have mm -hmm. backed up with data. Um, Thank you. That's great. That is very true. So Margie, I want to close with you. We've got about five, five more minutes um, before we shift to our top pieces of advice to kind of close out. But I thought It'd be important to give you a chance to talk about what you think are important uh, messages and opportunities for folks at the federal policy level to kind of shift attitudes on this education. There, you mentioned a number. There's sort of legal angles about how folks have been working, but are there particular ways people can take their stories or messages uh, into some of the work that you all are doing at the at the federal level? Yeah, I would say. It's not too late uh, to, and, and it probably will still have um, many months because, month, because regulations will still be being written uh, related to money that um, comes through as part of budget reconciliation. And there's always like next year, uh, next year's budget and the like. But I think, uh, I think one of the really big things to push is dual language learner identification. I just think that'll be the game changer. And in some ways, you know, um, it might be possible that we just get regulations written that say, um, oh, and when you use this money, um, you need to report how many dual language learners are served. I mean, that will cause many state um, administrators to faint, but, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it, it could happen that way. Of course, it could also happen legislatively. 
The issue is you don't want simple, um, a simple home language survey because the thing is you really, you really need the identification to be done in a way that is learning a lot more about the child's use of both languages so that then it's plugged into the actual um, uh, program model and program service that's being provided to the child. And then if you're gonna identify the kids, um, you really want that to be in your data system. And you know that's another kind of fainting spell or heart attack for folks who are trying to run the systems. And I, I don't say that glibly. I know it is a big deal. It's a big deal everywhere you know, where folks are trying to move it forward. But anyway, I, I, I think that uh, the big game changer would be that because without that, you really can't, you don't have a way to, it's so foundational to building um, effective quality services um, for families. And, uh, and then uh, uh, I know probably lots of folks who are listening in are parts of national networks one way or another. And I do think that there are maybe a hundred little ways to try and leverage this advancing equity executive order that the Biden administration and the Domestic Policy Council are really putting, um, are really taking seriously and all of the agencies are having to respond to it. And I, it will be an ongoing um, process. And our approach with data, and this is relevant, not just at the federal level with that um, executive order, but, uh, but also for folks we work with at the state and local level, um, our approach is to be producing data that um, is all census data. And so if there's a state demographer, if there's a local university, um, pretty much everything we're putting out could be replicated. So it's not like there's anything super fancy. We're not imputing immigration status. You know, we're really just doing straight up sociodemographic um, analyses. Did I just mute myself? Yeah, I think you just Sorry. muted yourself. Whoa, um, but uh, but um, so uh, so I would just say that um, that giving data um, that is easily replicable has been one of our strategies, but it shows either foreign born, native born, dual language learner households, non dual language learner households, so that it's very easy math to say that um, you know that that if you're in the early childhood space, we know that parents' levels of formal education, um, because they're so tied to earning ability, um, are completely tied to poverty. You know, poverty, the really big issue that drives everything in the early childhood space. So if you start to just ask questions about who's in poverty and what are their, um, what are characteristics that are relevant to poverty, um, all these things start to pop up that are really then unavoidable for policymakers that are putting the money out to the field and that are um, trying to, I, th I think there's, there's lots of sympathetic people inside systems, but they're ju it just takes a lot of energy to have processes begin to adapt themselves um, to taking some, of these, um, taking some of these issues more seriously. I think we're finally beyond the phase where you had folks saying, oh, well, these families just don't want services. You know, we, we went through a good decade or two of that. Um, if we do the services, will people come? I think, I think that's a, you know, I think folks are embarrassed now to be saying that, but they don't know how to really cross, you know, to the, um, to the other, um, you know, into really being proactive. And then the only other thing um, that I would say might be happening is a reauthorization of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, where, both workforce training services and adult education services live under that law. And that's where the great mistake, I would say, <laughs> of the reauthorization of the law in 2014, um, that really, you know, I, you know I, I would say it was negotiated, um, even though it passed in 2014, it started, you know, there were conversations about it um, post the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. There's a lot of criticism that job training was just getting people make jobs. And so there was this big push to have it be that, no, no, we're going to get people middle skill jobs and adult ed, you have to stop, you have to get more serious about getting people middle skill jobs. 
um, that require one year of community college education. And, you know, just the idea that adult education is the primary integration service in the country and the primary service that can help early childhood um, in terms of trying to work with immigrant parents just really um, could not, you know, just really was steamrolled over um, during that law. So I think, uh, I think we have enough evidence now and there's some, some, I don't know that there'll be simple fixes because it's still pretty powerful. This idea that we want that folks have to get into middle school jobs as a result of the, the law. But, um, but you know, you could, you could potentially exempt parents with young children from the employment requirements or parents who are, who don't work outside the home, just exempt them from the employment performance measures. Um, there's allegedly a statistical adjustment model that's supposed to give programs credit if they're serving um, higher challenge individuals. The statistical model um, is, I, I don't want, you know, let's just say it's, um, it's not anything like what it sounds like or what people think it is, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so anyway, I think there's a few, a few kind of tactical things that, you know, we could, that maybe could get done under that law. But I think the key thing is for everyone, everyone at the local level who thinks it's just them that they're having trouble serving parents has to start screaming and shouting that it's become impossible for them to serve parents with adult ed dollars so that we can have a more balanced conversation as, as that um, reauthorization process moves forward. And all these things trickle down to the state <laughs> and local level. So telling your, you know, be, being there for state and local policy conversations about that is critical. Yeah, thank you. I would add that um, historically, I think we've thought of immigrant issues as primarily urban contexts because that's where people kind of gravitated to because the greatest employment was there. And historically in our country, there were, you know, for example, Chinatowns or um, uh, Latino quarters of, of communities historically developed. But what we've seen in our work, uh, Aspen CSG focuses a lot of uh, majority of our work in rural um, uh, parts of the, of the US that the immigrant population is really the significant part of any population growth happening in rural communities. And so the opportunity to kind of raise these issues in a much broader geographic sense is now existing. And those communities are obviously um, struggling to sort of with even tougher resource limitations and tougher um, political support. Um, but to be able to link, it's now not just, you know, one or two cities in each state that uh, really have to um, face these challenges of, um, of how to serve immigrant families um, and with particularly education needs. And so I think there are going to be some greater opportunities for, uh, for a broader um, more holistic political conversation across geographies as well. So we are at the end. And so we really want to close with each person giving a really uh, concise description of sort of your best piece of advice for the folks doing this work uh, that they can take with them. Um, so uh, Carissa, I'm going to start with you and then go to Banu and then to Margie. Yeah. Um... I would say um, my best piece of advice would be to go ask the families um, that you're serving um, to get their input at every level um, and to just start small. Um, you don't have to uh, start with a full uh, fledged ESL program um, that's you know having great outcomes with, with children. You can start really small. Um, and if you can like prototype and fail fast um, and iterate quickly, um, and that that would be, you know, my my best sort of piece of advice to someone, no matter sort of what seat you're sitting in, um, in this conversation. Thanks, you. Uh -huh. Yeah, same. Define this. Do not ever think that you have the answer. You don't <laughs> until you ask people. Um, and then um, I really think that start with the home language, build from there. It's been like the best thing. Uh, we had somebody tell me that she came here, she didn't have any language. Um, so she was trying to take an, an advocacy class in English and she didn't learn anything because she was struggling with the language. If she had been given all of those skills in her home language, she could have done something about it even though she had a language barrier, right? So begin with language one, build the language to see the value in uh, bilingualism. 
Thank you. Margie? Um, I would say try to run programs like Carissa's and Bonnie, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, if you can't, um, or if you can't right now, that, uh, that reaching parents is the most important thing you can do. That we're, it's going to take us a long time to build effective um, services for uh, dual language learner kids and to have their parents be appropriately served by existing systems. Parents are the army we have right now. And so reaching them with home visiting, early childhood type services, just the things that would really help them uh, be, um, be doing for their kids what ECEC services, of course, not child care and the like, but that really, I, I just think it's, a, it's gonna be a long road for us and that parents are the key and, um, and fighting for programs that can really meet parents where they're at is, um, you know, is the number one thing I think we could do um, policy wise from a practical point of view, while we also fight every day on all the other policy issues. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I want to second that. I think that um, parents, the ability for parents to be able to speak about what they want for their kids and their families is a great kind of human unifier that people often think folks that they see as different from them may not want the same things and that can make people fearful, but really when people hear about parents wanting the same things for their kids that they want for their own, um, and that humanity is hard to, harder to deny, um, and I think uh, is, is a great unifier. Uh, and so both having the parent voice in the program um, design and description, but also in the advocacy and messaging with the community um, can really is an important element. So uh, thank you all so much for uh, your time and contributions for being a part of this. We are gonna close things out um, from here. Uh, I wanna thank all the folks who uh, joined us today. We had a, a well over 150 folks uh, on the webinar and many more. As we said, all of you will Get everyone who registered will get a link to the recording. Um, if you're interested in, re in contacting uh, today's speakers, we have some emails here. Uh, we can share contact information with the permission of the of uh, Banu and Carissa. Um, but we want to make sure uh, to remind folks again um, of our coming peer learning session. Um, Get to that slide next. Uh, on October 28th. Um, and again, that's a great opportunity for more dialogue. You will hear, we'll have uh, the panelists from today participating um, with members from their teams. And uh, folks whose questions are selected will invite you to bring a team. Uh, and, and our panelists and the audience will really dive into the question the challenge that you have, and you'll be able to get a lot of feedback and advice from both our panelists, our resource team, and the audience, which is a, a really unique opportunity. Uh, and then our final and fourth um, webinar uh, in this series on cultural competency, Secrets to Success, uh, on November 10th. As, as everyone noted, that is a common theme that came up in every one of our webinars so far. So uh, the links to, the, to that, how you can register for those events are in the chat box. So thank you again um, for attending. Thanks to all of our speakers today for their time and wisdom in participating. And uh, we hope you all have a great rest of your day. <laughs>